and how it can actually change the world. Okay. Don't yeah. over the Take table, a round the table. <laughs> I can sit next to Russell. I sent a text message to someone this morning saying, Dubrovnik is beautiful, but it would be even more beautiful if you were here. Wow. Cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, it's not my place to uh, own, but I think it's okay. Let's not talk about the price of eggs, shall we? Let's talk about uh, what's really a little more important, which is something like... We each and everybody has uh, something like a telephone and I mind when the person whom I love doesn't call me every evening or sends a sweet message. So in respect to all of the very ordinary things, why can't we talk about how Lockwood can be well special in uh, uh, in that way you know special in a PS life too short and uh, I'm bored by the critical theory that will make us proper I can't stand it. We don't have too much time. Let's use it as well as we properly can. That's it. to this uh, brunch breakfast. Um, since we had this wonderful concert last night, which is the second uh, yeah. happening in this, in this fortress, and I think we all were surprised, and I'm always surprised, from the incredible quality of sound of that particular space. And since um, maybe certain ideas relating to the use of this space for specific sound purposes and the use also of Lockwood, maybe to introduce elements of um, sound production and um, inspirational sort of, um, I can say, exposure or, or uh, working sort of with the site, with the context, um, to deepen of one's own practice, especially in, with regard to sound. We thought that this sort of little expert round, since there's so many people using sound, either in their artistic practices as the visual artists and, and, and artists who work with uh, media in the largest sense, or as sound artists and, and musicians, and I think in all of your practices, these uh, borders and disciplinary sort of uh, fragmentations don't really apply in that particular sense. I'm very happy that Russell has well, Florian, you know, Danica, Rocky, who uh, hasn't spoken yet, but is a wonderful artist and friend from Iceland, and Nadia uh, Mustafic will share with you a few ideas about that particular topic.
go. So I think um, what we are together here is I think like we can um, think of a, um, a futuristic use of of sound in space in in a, um, in, in performance and also like in the means of like uh, realizing a, a, a production venue. I would like to ask you, Russ, the sound studio in in um, connection with this uh, indoor outdoor space of the fortress. Um, where you think this could uh, could lead to? Uh, well, obviously, the, as we witnessed yesterday, the, the fortress has very uh, interesting acoustic qualities, which hopefully we uh, tested and challenged the space yesterday. Uh, and so we've already uh, proven that it's a great space for performance of any, probably any other type of sound work or other types of uh, presentation. Uh, as well as showing films and so on. Uh, and the idea with the, the studio in the fortress is that as well as having a uh, very high-tech, new, top-spec studio environment, it will be unlike any other studio, hopefully, and quite unique in its own uh, properties. But there will be the ability to record the uh, any performances that happen in this fortress in the future. So it will work as a, a recording environment as well as a recording studio. Uh, <coughs> which is a, a great platform for well, What stuff don't activities. we know yet? Yes, exactly, yeah. Uh, I'm uh, more interested in that. Uh, what stuff do we not have any comprehension because uh, you and I were friends for a long time and we uh, adore certain things yes. and uh, we've been in a space of uh, a vowel when we've said yes Karlheinz Stockhausen, John Cage, Janis Zenakis, many people who have inspired us uh, how can we make this more possible the I'm ambitious. I really love the idea that the recording studio can uh, do stuff that we don't even know what it means yet. Why not? It's so simple. Exactly. And that's why it will be implemented in this environment. I mean, I hate the idea of being generous, but actually I think it's okay. <laughs> uh, there will be people who have a different idea. And sorry to butt in, but uh, it's not in. I think, well, uh, something becomes available here, and I think we should uh, make that uh, prospect clear. And if we can't do anything else, then we're wasting our time. So can we pass this on? <laughs> um, we need a more direct question, right? But, I mean, I, definitely one of the great aspects of that uh, fortress is that it is, has this acoustical quality and is still an open air space. Yeah? And I think this duality of being indoor-outdoor at the same time and kind of switching from these two realities is particularly strong when I mean, we just lie there in the grass as we did yesterday and have this extremely physical sound which kind of carries you up to the roof nearly. I'm not embarrassed by magic. I'm really not. Yeah. And I think it's okay to just uh, feel that you're not in prison. Yeah. You can actually uh, be intelligent and meet the heart in a productive way. 
No, but particularly the fact that the space itself is not changed in any way. That the ground, the, the floor, the walls, I mean, it's all, it all has... Well, the location's there, it's, it's fixed as it were. And as I mentioned very briefly yesterday in the, <coughs> in the, on the panel when Francesca asked me to briefly describe something that's in the process of being done anyway, and it's very in its uh, early stages. The, 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 the reality that the, the, within the fortress, it's performance space, it's untouched. It's uh, the equipment is as invisible as possible. Is that important for you? Make, well, yeah, exactly. For sure, but then, yeah. but then, on the other hand, within the the studio, which doesn't exist yet, the space is there, and is all to, apart from having uh, size restrictions. Uh, this is something that will grow and will uh, hope. Well, my intention is to make now, it unlike how does any it other feel? studio. What does it mean to make a noise in that space? Because you're both euphoric. Yeah. Well, talk a bit about that and what it means. Well, I think what we like, kind of like, eventually try to have to get rid of is this um, the notion and and the uh, the idealization of an ideal sound or something like. What, what is considered as a good sound. Like, you introducing, like, with uh, having a, a studio, like, the, the possibilities to produce a very, very new sound, which you then are putting in the space. But the, um, the notion of the, the space there is, I think, is in, in any performance space, uh, is often considered, like, very, very backward. Like, the, the, like why is a, a square box considered as the, uh, a good concert hall, for example? I think we can em embrace like the the, uh, the mental options of the of the studio to produce something that then you kind of putting in the in the space and you're, you're superimposing a, um, a invis a immaterial architecture in there. It's also uh, hugely embarrassing as a space. You know, it's Renaissance. It's tacky. It's kitsch. Uh, so we walk into this historical space and uh, all this stuff that we must obey is around us. So we must be something like polite to the horrible people who occupied it. Can you imagine how awful those monks must have been? <laughs> uh, so why should we really be in abeyance to anything because it's old? And I'm very, very fascinated by what our mm, project might be to uh, not think that that's available anymore. Uh, I have an enormous amount of respect for, okay, the medieval latrine. Yeah, one should obey and... Uh, yeah. What was toilet paper made out of? I don't know. However, I think we now can sound different, make <coughs> different uh, music, make different uh, reflection on the world. And I think that's talking a bit too much, but I think it's okay. I'm just interested in uh, what it means to hear the sounds that you made yesterday evening and uh, how we can understand that. I remember them quite clearly. I think that's the interesting part is that you kind of forget that you're in this medieval fortress in a certain sense. I mean, you forget the medievalness of the fortress once you, you know, you have such an evening as yesterday's. I don't agree with you. No, I mean, yeah, I, I, really I don't, don't care. Have, everything I became medieval. I think you're absolutely very aware of yeah. the architecture and the, and the space around you and, you know, even the fact that um, we decided yesterday to leave the, the tiki lamps on mm. because we wanted to see it more, whereas in the last concert, we had it totally in Black darkness, out. and really all it did was frame the sky, and you became less aware of the stones and the walls. 
and the medieval ramparts, but still, I think even in total darkness, you're aware of what it is. And I think it's not about forgetting one or the other, and it's again not about juxtaposing two opposites in the same space either, and I think that's what's interesting, what Karak is saying, it's about translating and about challenging. It's also very similar to what... It Ross sounded Ross so about. different last night, yeah. and I loved it. It reminded me of things that I hadn't imagined for a while. And, well, I, I would add a thank you again, because th this is very special. We can all sit around and talk about what it means, but unless there's some love involved, it's nothing. The love is here. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't mean also to say that it was neutral. I think it is a space of age, but it's, it doesn't have this medievalness, I think, that uh, Karis is referring to this sort of stage medievalness. That was one of the discussions we had with Olafur when he first came in and he said, don't touch the space, right? don't alter it or don't make it more like this image of a medieval fortress. It is what it is, it has its history, it has its properties and these physical properties as they are, you know, are surfaces where everybody has its own possible projections. And what makes it interesting is not the fact that it is a medieval complex, but what makes it interesting in terms of sound is that it has these enormous sound qualities and that it functions, I mean, that these acoustics there without fetishizing. But so I think this playful, is, so playful. I think what is very, like, uh, what we should, like, keep in mind is that it's a, it's a unique space. And, uh, like, the, um, speaking about uh, sonic qualities is... Um, is something that still is like very, very much in the, in, in the past. Mm -hmm. And I think what we could like, uh, since we're all like working on this table, like somehow with, with sound, uh, I think it's, we can like speak about um, a, a, a sonic future, something that, that uh, a space you could like put in, in, this, in this space and, and not think so much about the medievalness of it. Uh, like what it means like to have a unique space to create something. Like all like like concert halls and all these things like have been like standardized for like the last century. Like every concert hall, like like the, you have the Leipzig uh, Gewandhaus, which then turned into Boston um, in the Boston con concert hall, and 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 it almost was a model like taken from from somewhere in the world, like put put somewhere else. And I think like this is something like acousticians can can do, but I think like our like what what we in this table can do is we have is, an ambition to um, change this. Um, speak about like what to put in the space rather than kind of like how to make the space sound yeah um and uh yesterday evening was just a uh, an experiment and um a test like to, to put uh, uh, an experiment uh, to put different uh, types of um, sound in the space and i think the only way to perf to measure a space is by performing it you you can't measure it like if you gonna you're always going to miss out on on on, on some. Uh, you can measure the acoustics, but what what will it give you if you like know like okay the reverb is like uh, one one second long. It, it um, um, I think I think this is this is like so 20th century. I think like mm -hmm. you should stop it. The grammar is uh, reductive. We can look at plan of the building, and it doesn't teach us much. Kara, do you remember in the exhibition that you did in Paris, you know, you were, it meant so incredibly much to you to have Florian's piece in that exhibition mm -hmm, yeah. because of the sound dimension which you felt was needed because you were in that clinical museum white cube space of, of, of the, you know, and then bringing in this ele other element had this additional and positive effect on, on the, and you were telling me the resonance throughout the whole exhibition was extremely important to you. I think in the same way what you were showing me this morning with the Xenaxis book and how those sound projects that he did also incorporated light and a further in experience into this and 
I think that what I've been emphasizing in the last few discussions has been the, the multidisciplinary approach to people working together and creating these sort of environments which incorporate different sort of trajectories that bring kind of the attention of, in a way, of, if you want, away from the medievality of the place, but at the same time celebrating it, you know? So for me, the sound piece yesterday would have, I would have preferred it without the tiki lamps at the end, because I was focusing on the stars so much, I kept being convinced that there was, you know, somebody out there was listening to this concert. Keep being convinced. It's really important. I think that's a really great thing to say. Uh, we can order this out of existence. Uh, ultimately, my real feeling is that we should uh, communicate with uh, fellow feeling. You know, it's not so difficult, and one can extend. And now I sound very old-fashioned, and the last thing that I ever wanted to do was this, but. Uh, there is such a prospect. It is possible. It is possible. <coughs> and uh, let's make that more available here. That's my idea. That's my uh, wish for... Uh, now I sound like an old hippie. But... I think, well, we don't have a clue what can be made here yet. So let's hold on to that idea, because uh, otherwise it's boring. Hey. Oh, I'm going to be embarrassing now, because it's just, we're all fucking sitting here just going, well, what's the best thing that can happen? It's happening already. <coughs> Let's fucking relax and just get into it. It's absolutely here. So maybe yeah. like a, in in doing something in, in in such a space, what what comes to your what what do you see what do you see in there? Yeah, I was thinking about it yesterday. <coughs> that, uh, that with spaces, I'm re in like in my in my in my work as an artist. I really love to work in spaces that are that have uh, <coughs> more character, that are have that are not uh, art spaces, uh, that are that are full of some energy, that of something that was there before. And when you put some some art piece in it, it becomes like bah, because the energy of the place, you know, makes the the <coughs> art piece greater. Elevating. What? <coughs> Elevating. Elevating. Yeah. And, and with, uh, sorry to in interrupt, but with energy, you, you're, you're not speaking about the acoustic energy, I assume, no, but on I'm a just speaking about some kind of, you know, energy. some kind of, uh, the intervention. yeah, just like imaginary energy. Like you think, like you come to the fortress and you're like, and you get this, what has happened here, what, and, and, and the history and everything. And, the, and you just, you just start, it kind of, it is very important for everything that happens in it. It's kind of like a, I always think, I always believe in the, in the kind of the 20th century scientific approach to ghosts. I always love it when people were trying to record walls and stuff that they that they thought yeah, they they were like <coughs> magnetic tapes and like if you put the if you put the right uh, electric tension into the wall, <coughs> it block out some wipes, and you can actually hear voices that are recorded in the wall. And you know, it's a kind of a silly idea, but I. Can we do that? I think we should do. Try. I think. If, I mean. Leif Algren talks of. Leif uh, yeah. The Swedish artist talks of. Like the way a, a phonograph record, a needle sits in the groove, and you can play back this sound that's been captured and recorded in this groove. So could you also take the groove of a paint? stroke in oil <coughs> yeah. and possibly hear the sound of Rembrandt studio or any other equivalent because of the grooves and grains. 
Yeah. But I'm just wondering whether it's important to sort of have such references about the past. Okay. Because so little is known about this place, and other than the fact that it was a defensive um, structure to protect the local villagers from inevitable attacks, and we can, you can more or less find out who were the marauding pirates and. You know, what was the role of the, um, the monks on the island? I mean, Barbara came up with this incredible concept. I mean, that, that, that in fact poisoning was a kind of regular, regular occurrence, uh, occurrence. Mm. <coughs> particularly these poisons were created by the monks. And it was actually the Dominican monasteries that had the antidote and the Franciscans that had the poison. And uh, these were, you know, so you can, Better, and this is needless to say, not documented, nor was it sort of particularly documented in that time. But it's more about what you make of all of that yourself today. Because sure. when you look at the monastery, we talked about the revitalization and the sort of restoration, and I've gone through the whole restoration program with you guys. And I think that there comes a point where you can really get frustrated or, you know, because you have so many archaeologists and people telling you, ah, oh, you can't put the door here because there was, and then there all this, you know, the historical, this place sort of grew over centuries, it changed over centuries, it's had so many layers and so many histories that I think it just is much more interesting to sort of turn that into an, a, a new reality rather than focusing endlessly on the past. I mean, I'm yeah. saying that because 15 years of conservation hardens you a little bit. Yeah, you know I mean? so I think, I think growing like, what, what, what the stones concept, are different you know, histories. That's what's interesting. It's a different way of writing history. It's like Istanbul. You know, you go to Istanbul and you ask yourself, you ask every person will tell you a different story about Istanbul and the history of Istanbul. And the more interesting interpretation would be to make up incredible stories about enough. Istanbul yeah. and integrate them into historical facts and confuse people even further. Do you know what I mean? Because well, there's never one story. No, but what I'm, I think what I'm saying or, uh, <laughs> comes up here is it's not interesting to sort of record the history of the Turks coming in this year and the uh, Venetians coming that year. That is the kind of formalized way of looking at history in its it's linearity. It's funny because that's what I thought last night. I thought, I mean, I don't mean it. In any, in it. I didn't want to talk about it because I, didn't, I don't want to be misunderstood in any kind of offensive way. <laughs> The gay club. <laughs> Go for oh. it. But I was thinking, Go. you know, just listening to this completely new mu uh, sound, uh, you know, the first time the walls of this uh, castle is experiencing and reflecting this sound for the first time, probably. Second. I don't yeah. Second. So, second time. Second time. So, but then, eventually, kind of, as, as the performance got longer and longer, I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if, like, the Turks had access to this technology 500 years ago and surrounded the castle and played for three months. <laughs> they you did. Know? They did. And what would have been inside, you know? And it kind of led me to these kind of historical fantasies. But let's yeah, go back to the future. That's the definition yeah. of a scene. And, uh, <laughs> let's go. Yeah, and this I love, is true. I, I, love what you said, uh, no, I, I love what you said about the, the finally the, the poison. It's Apparently, it's a chemistry. It's a chemistry industry. If we recompose uh, history, it's not exactly a monk. It's just a, it's just a sectum creating a chemistry industry to create the poison. So finally, the, the, the war around are not protected the monk against the barbarian. The world is protecting the people living here around against the monk. So they put the wall to protect the village against themselves because they use the poison to, of course, to absorb like a cobaye. I'm sure they play the game of cobaye. Well, I'm issue. sure they discover some universe parallel, totally outside the perfect religious way, of course. So it was a perfect craziness, monkey attitude, doing poison and testing poison on themselves. On the wall, it's just the limit of the industry, chemical industry to protect the outside from themselves, like a little bit like the cyberpunk. Like the cyberpunk cultures when they are so wearing monk. some glass, <laughs> some mirror glass to protect the other <laughs> against themselves. So cyberpunk monk, it's interesting wow. to, to, to he's go a, this he's way. He's a cyber this monk. <laughs> and you're a this cyber monk. super extreme. <laughs> oh, all the best. Wow. But like, I, I, I totally agree that, I mean, this is, there's this history and it's like, it's just loaded with it. Like, I mean, the, Kind of like a sonic history there. It's 
Yeah, but what's the Sonic Future? Yeah, and then, like then, between, then that's the important the past, part. Like then you can stick a microphone in that's the fun. You go, you go and and uh, and create. You know, I'm a little bit nervous. Make now my place to uh, space. Story. So, uh, Daniela, <laughs> there are people also sitting on the table who haven't had the chance to say anything yet. But mm. they so can I'm interject interested. any time. It's not a formal mm. lecture. Okay. Yeah. It's just you have to but, jump uh, in. I think. And this is what I have to just state right here Sorry. now. These are all supposed to be informal debates. They're not a lecture series with a bunch. Otherwise, we'd call them symposiums. So I said that when I my first two talks, I asked people to jump in and you know interfere, and, and which a couple of times I did. So I well, you're good at that. It. So it's not a surprise. <laughs> Otherwise, it just gets too long. I mean, I'm sure when we are doing music inside, we are creating a new domesticity. We, we finally clean the approach of the, of the monastery before... Oh, do you think we, so? I don't think so. If, if no. We, uh, imagine before <coughs> in the history how people would be scary about this monastery. Uh. Oh, the scariness coming from the building and com coming from the comportment of the people inside. And now we are just uh, playing the game of a perfect domesticity, revival. No, fuck off. We're not nothing. Mm. <laughs> We're not nothing. Very, very gentle. I very refuse very to very be taken down to your male Marxist little shit. Fuck off. Bad. No. Terribly we uh, are conventional and nothing correct. but totally interesting. And correct. Make music inside the history part and play the game of gentle people talking to themselves with perfect music. And those shoes, no. can you believe no. it? That is really Ladies Morocco. and gentlemen. Morocco <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's you. <laughs> yeah, they are quite impressive. All the best. <laughs> See? <laughs> <laughs> this happens too. Okay. It's a cream of the monk. <laughs> <laughs> but genuine is a problem to a certain extent because we, uh, how can one be genuine? How, ca how can one be responsible? Uh, I'll be trying too hard to be rational, democratic <coughs> people. Fuck off. Art knows no boundaries. Pleasure knows no nothing but the greatest sophistication that can be brought into the way in which well love is possible i really believe this i think if art knows no boundaries i think that there's also other ways of presenting so i mean i don't think we should focus this entire debate just on the fortress i mean i think it's yeah. a great departure because the fortress is the focus of, of a performance last night that was quite extraordinary i also really loved watching the films i mean your the films that you brought were extraordinary in in that space you know <clears throat> no matter how cold it got i really wanted to see them in, in that location i thought they worked so incredibly well together <coughs> so there's just so much potential there this, i think each project and each artist will have that own responsibility to you know have their you know interference uh, or their create their own interference in a way and i think that the word interference is more relevant than just the flattery of the space which i think is what you're saying mm -hmm. we're all saying we don't want yeah. to just flatter the space we want to, you know, provoke it because it is a, a complete, in, in conservation terms, it's an utter reinvention. I mean, it's, you're not sort of using it at all for the purpose it was created. That's the clear message. It's embarrassingly so, glamorous. It really is. <laughs> no, this place is just, uh, well, ouch. Be careful. Don't invite Pink Floyd to play. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be careful. You only have us. And we're better. <laughs> so get used to it. <laughs> yeah, it's just a question of attitude. How how you, how how this tortoise is made futuristic and exciting. I mean, it could just be a Pink Floyd venue. Yes. But the uh, first no. performance that we were going to have in it, Francois wanted to fill it with rock violas and seal it off. Yeah. And let everybody just hear the sound of dogs going wild wow. on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> not let anybody in. I invite people to go in if they dare. 
Wow. That you is quite that. good. I, I like that. Yeah. But from so like proposing something like this, you're kind of like you're widening the, the acoustic horizon of the uh, <laughs> of the of the boundary yeah. of the physical boundaries of the of the fortress. In introducing a sound, you're perceiving as being outside as well. Is this the case? I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Boris was telling me the last days about another sound um, gathering place, which you wanted to, maybe you can... Which? <laughs> which one? <laughs> which one? I don't know. You, remember you were saying yesterday as well that there is this um, place in the desert where people come together and it's a no, sound... No, it's just a studio. It's one of, one of many studios in the world, but this one is particular. It's called Rancho de la Luna. And it's near Joshua Tree in Arizona Desert. And, uh, oh, oh, California. Yeah. But she hasn't been. And uh, yeah, it's a place where people go to to meet and to do sessions. Yeah. The moon day. Isolated. Pinterella de Luna. Moon day. They create something special. So you, even a band was established on on that kind of spontaneous gathering, which is called desert sessions. You can even watch a video. One video clip on MTV. So, but it started as a recording studio. It started as a recording studio, which one one guy just adapted the ranch for that reason, and then he was building uh, uh, several facilities, very modest facilities all around. And uh, I mean, there was already a potential. We're talking about wanting to do a concert on a glacier. Which we've already arranged, by the way. Wonderful. <laughs> well, I yeah, for, for us. It's I mean, I know in Iceland, the play, people are performing sound and music in, in the, in all over the place. I mean, yeah. That's also, you know, the nature and sometimes natural landscape is the best resonance. No? Sure. Okay. Like, I mean, yeah. do, it's do, a do site, all the it? artists sitting up on this panel sort of prefer being in a sort of wilderness or in, in a kind of objet trouvé, or do they prefer? A studio environment or a gallery or a space that has a kind of special acoustic, um, I mean, in a contemporary. Group. Do you understand the question? Yeah. 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 Um, well, um, I'm not a sound artist uh, other than the, the, the sound dimension that I'm using in some uh, video installations. Um, but the, the, the specificity of a site or, or even calendar specificity for some um, for some pieces um, uh, I, I, I often well I, I did a lot of uh, works that are specific in that way uh, and uh, it's not exclusively the kind of work uh, I do so I wouldn't say for my practice it's Imperative that I, I, I always <coughs> have to have a space, particular space uh, to respond. To. Uh, but I definitely love the uh, uh, when, when there is an, an occasion to use the space and, and the layers of meaning that adds to it. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I, mean, I haven't answered the question. But not the core of my practice. But since Francois is here, maybe you'd like to tell us about, about the poison garden idea, because no, that's another uh, space. Uh, no, about the space, it's, it's seen that when we are renovating the building as an architect, immediately we unfold the unknown. We flood the unknown. And all the situation of un unaccessibility, which is all, all the time a part of a rumor of something we don't know immediately by renovation. Everything is unplanned. Everything is unfold. Everything in the inside the visible part, and we in, at this time we immediately lose the part of mystery of the of the situation. So it's not about history. It's not about mystery. And uh, how we uh, keep intact this mystery by adding rumor, by adding fiction, by adding. Uh, by adding another layer, not to recompose the, the, the previous or historic layer, but to add layer. And this adding layer 
is able to not to renovate but to create the continuity of the story, not of the history, but of the story of something appearing, scariness, and the where, where the monks are playing the game of, uh, of uh, alchemy, three, alchemy three production of poison. So in this way, we are. In, I was interesting to do to revive uh, to, to to produce perhaps a, a garden of the toxic plants of the of the of the landscape of European landscape and there is a lot of toxic plants in Datura, you know more than me and uh, because you are a botanist or biologist and botanist. So in fact there is a lot of toxic plants which have been used in medical way and we could it would be interesting to revive this kind of toxicity fears about toxicity as a chemistry industry you have some um, Russian puppets where some parts are accessible some parts are inaccessible because of the danger so is to develop a protocol, re uh, redevelop a protocol of, uh, of this uh, inaccessibility through the revival of production of toxicity. So a garden, I think about a garden, but not only a garden, also perhaps uh, 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 is it a library, to library where we could uh, smell, touch the distillation of the toxicity, where finally the alchemist, alchemist production could be a little bit re reduced <coughs> as practice, but also as runner. Yes. Not only as practice, uh, but also as stories, as a, as a stories where people around in the village redefine their scariness, re re redefine the scariness of this strange, strange era where something arrives about the unknown. About uh, so uh, we know our rumor could uh, grow and grow and grow. Uh, and, uh, and we could just inject this kind of hypothesis to revive uh, or renovate uh, the idea or re re redo a palpitation, reintroduce a palpitation of the, of the but how, how do you see How do you see this scariness develop? Because if you have a garden, clearly people walking through gardens, they kind of look at it and say, well, this is this plant, that's that plant, and they have little information about the... I know, because you, you, you have all the strategy, all the strategy of design. Some plant, could, it's not to make a garden on the, on the, on, 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 on the floor, it's like hydroponic garden, very sophisticated, where you could touch the plant, and so you could wash your hand. So, uh, uh, it's something as a strategy of protocol of scariness, protocol of fears. And, of course, it has to be designed. So, the, the design has to participate <coughs> to this uh, negotiation. A of protocol course, of desire. Not to kill, it's not to kill people. It's not to, why not? Some babies. Or yes. <laughs> Danger. <laughs> but to negotiate with the danger. Of course, in this negotiation, we could introduce some uh, tricky, some tricky system where it's totally safe, but it seems <coughs> to be unsafe. But right there's also right. an element of uh, you have to be. Uh, there's a certain amount of information because most people are not frightened purely out of ignorance because they don't know how dangerous something is. When I travelled around here during the war zone until I saw a mortar land and I. W saw what shrapnel does, I had no idea what fear, <laughs> you know, because that, that, so you have to, I mean, I, I was with a war journalist friend of mine who was rolling under cars every five minutes, and I was like, what are you doing? He goes, you, ha you don't know what this stuff can do. So it's just fear, it's, it's based on, on, mm. on knowledge as opposed to ignorance. Well, and I guess what I'm saying is that it's really because the domesticity of the nature became so, so ugly, so ugly now because of ecology. So to understand that if you touch a datura or a digital just by your hand, and if you, if you, if you do that on your mouse, finally you could be sick immediately. So the, nat the nature around you is in the one that is incredibly dangerous. Incredibly dangerous here, not outside, not in a foreign country. Here, so to renegotiate with this uh, wild nature around you is something interesting. In fact, something it's like a renegotiation, uh, 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 very far away from a, a moralistic attitude about domesticity. Of and so, yeah, what I think also is that. There's a fine line between what is medicine and what is medicine. And so the I will play a little bit of a special down the road. We have a, a local interruption, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> no, but the plan there was to build the top of the garden, which was to store the seeds. Right, so that in itself is such a bit, the perfect basis. 
right? And that just, and that tells you that that there is. Yeah, I, 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 you, you eat some fish or fugu in Japan. You, uh, perhaps some, some of you eat some fugu in Japan where the, the cooker mm -hmm. needs to keep right. a part of the toxicity and when it's well prepared, you fill your mouth totally like, uh, like, in, a, like in a dentist but or why take totally it so uh, frozen, totally frozen. Why it's why like a coke. so like au premier degré, you know? It's a, you can always think, okay, this was once a place where it looks like and were being produced. And now contemporary art is being produced and people can have you know, dubious approach to creativity. Some people feel threatened. If you use too much of it, it can be dangerous. If you take little bit, little bit, it could be medicinal. You could just kind of take well, pleasurable. that pleasurable <laughs> and kind of treat this kind of plant uh, production history or deuxième degré and then just because we want to have a psychedelic a, production a, a, yeah. here, you know, it's, it's about not consumption. Not I think a whole bunch of people are going to jump for the 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 Last night, the sound work could be uh, like one of those toxic exactly. plants. There were one of the I just actually go and take one to one and plant. Me too. Me too. But again, this 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 particular piece is um um. But to take it so literally. It's producing a certain tone in your ear. So yeah. in fact, it was physical. It yeah. is. It it is your your ear crazy. is turning into a. It's a. Um, um, your ear is turning into an instrument. So it is actually emitting a tone, which is this the certain tone. That's why you're perceiving it as, as that loud. So I think what Prosa said with the um, mystics. I think like this is also like, um, and if we look on on uh, sites worldwide for sound like. Like they're all like very very unique, like a, a glacier or like the history of, of studios of, of 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 any any space ha has this uh, this totally u uniqueness, and I think like what um, a reintroduction of um, mystics for a place like this uh, is ultimately about the, the content you you put in the the sonic content that could be like produced in a studio or could be like uh, superimposed yeah, or performed why is in the that, space. That sound and mysticism always kind of <laughs> seem to be in a kind of. Because the shamans used it. Or so you see yourself as a shaman of the sort of. Well, like one 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 example. An alchemist. It's a, a uh, cave, like cave uh, <laughs> acoustics. Like you, you had the, the first uh, uh, the first notion of uh, uh, echo and reflection happened in caves, and and you couldn't explain it. So like. It must have been somebody else speaking to you through the cave. Mm. So they, and this is like one of the very early uh, uh, connections of sound and, and, and mystery. And Plato's cave as well, so it's sound. And yeah. <laughs> but even like much, much before that. Yeah, but also yeah. if you have Jericho, the trumpets of Jericho, and you have also very early, early listening to the universe, the music of the universe. The, so the audible, audible reality was always present in. in in kind of Madness. understanding of, of, of the nature mm -hmm. and God, because God also had had, we can <coughs> say, because he's already dead, uh, 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 also audible quality, which then is transferred to a, to a church music, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et so even a church no, music I, is I mean, I understand where it comes from. I'm just mm -hmm. curious. I understand where it comes from. I'm just curious uh, to know why it still has that resonance. You know why. Basically, this attraction between mysticism because it, because it touches all perceptual, complex perceptual system of human being, including muscles, whatever. No, but paint, you know, painting had a, was also a practice of no, painting e you observe via, via, via eyes, but sound is, is no, no. Can I say something? I was thinking about this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was thinking yesterday that. First, my first reaction was that maybe I wasn't like a sound person because I was saying to myself, you know, I'm not really, maybe I'm not a firm <coughs> believer that all our five senses should be treated equally. But then it made me make the distinction that, like, because then I questioned myself because I make video. But um, I think I don't. I don't really make video, I actually do narrative, I mean, it's like it's something more, you employ the visual in order to say something else, as in painting, who said the painting? Yeah. Yeah, as in painting, 
uh, whereas sound is still uh, what um, well, this what we experienced last, last night was really <laughs> sound <laughs> and not not a truck passing by, which is narrative. Well, sound is as narrative as anything else. Sound can be narrative. I mean, that's not me. You know, I think the last night performance was in itself not an abstract thing, but really a narration yeah. and uh, animation given some time. Uh, the animation goes up to such a level that it becomes almost theatrical, almost visual, you know. So I think uh, it happens also in sound. What, what do you think about it? Yeah, the, I think the idea of animation is, uh, um, I think we can speak of uh, acoustic illumination of a space. So you're, you're filling the space, you only perceive the space if you like put a sound in there. Like the, otherwise you would not perceive the <coughs> space without a sound. It's like uh, clapping your hands. You're always, you're always producing sound. So you're always like sending out this kind of like radiation uh, and yesterday evening, like certain parts have been like radiated like very very highly in order like to illuminate the space like as with the brightest uh, uh, but it light. But isn't only illumination because if it's an abstract sound, then it gives the the space uh, it makes the space appear. Yours is more a, an interpretation. You know that there are there are other. In well, we have to say that yesterday, like it was, the uh, 21 pieces from different composers. Um. So it was we a, have to do a, it again tonight. Uh, 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 <laughs> 21 easy pieces. <laughs> 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 That's title of CD. <laughs> no, but you, ca you can't uh, separate like audible quality of the sound and, and the touch because it's it, 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 it always works. I mean, together. Yeah, of course. So it's. Not only, it's, 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 it's super complex thing. Painting doesn't do any direct physical pressure on you. It does. But it sound does. Sometimes it does. No, it, it never does. It, it, it's abstraction. Uh, abstraction. But sa sound but really touches you. Sound is an is a, is a invisible hand. No, but uh, Helen Frank is silent, for instance. She has, uh, you know, a really bright color and in front of the painting even you have the color on your body, you know, it's reflect. So uh, but that's I, think a difference. I think there is no difference. <laughs> <laughs> I think I the, big, the big difference is, is that uh, with the, uh, with vision you don't have to, you, you don't have to do something. With with sound you have to be active to perceive it. A any any object is is re generating a reflection. Is is all like kind of like uh, shaping the the acoustic properties of the table we are sitting here and uh, a picture is not doing this, it's not active. That's and not true. Sound, <laughs> sound not true. I agree. I agree. Sound, sound, can be, sound can be, we were talking about toxic, sound can be toxic. You can, like a, like a, a, a friend of mine, he, he, like he, has, he has constant gift in his, uh, in his soul because he, he feels uh, responsible for killing a man. With uh, with uh, some uh, some sonic ex experiments, he had, he had a punk band. And they were playing like really loud punk music, but then he he produced some overtones that nobody could hear, so that everybody was just sitting down in the punk concert. It was like uh, some hippie atmosphere and extremely brutal music, and it was these overtones were really you know dangerous if you just come in and out of them. And there was this one guy who was a waiter in the in the bar. He just came in and out and in and out, and he died that night. <laughs> so, yeah. Heart attack, or yeah, yeah. But I think there's <coughs> also a problem in terminology because if you're speaking about sound, you know, you can then use uh, that's how I meant it. You know, it's yeah. light, <laughs> and because it's Before not sound and painting, it's sound and light. It's about the wavelength and yeah. things that you can perceive and not. This is uh, the right terminology. You know? Yeah. So Which one is better? Sound or light? Both. <laughs> no. no. So it's. Uh, no, I, I just this idea of design as a risk. Mm. So how we could redesign or reintroduce the designs as monastery as a cadaveric ski. Yeah? 
as a risk. It's clear that if you reduce the beat of the sound to the beat of the earth, immediately you you approach the dancer, you, you force the dancer. Uh, like remember Castanoller when he's using the frequency of the light directly leaning to the frequency of the brain. Immediately if you close your mind, if you close your eye, you see some incredible images because there is a resonance of frequency of the light with the frequency of the brain. So finally, it's not a, only a subjectivity net about sound, it's a direct effect on what we could do inside, physic physically and physiologically, on the body. Mm. And not only about uh, the subjectivity net of art. Yeah. We have to be literal. We have to be literal. We have to recompose a kind of literality which, which is a, a story of a, the story of the danger, which approaches the story of the danger. Well, we, I think, can uh, approach this uh, danger, but we have to re uh, approach it somehow responsibly, because uh, With otherwise yeah. it's expressionism, and I think we're, we're careful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> expressionism! Of course! <laughs> But I think also what's interesting, because Barbara was also mentioning the fact that this was also a hospital and that, that it was believed that patients healed better if they lay in close vicinity of the church because then they could hear the mass and they could hear the choir and that that upstairs part of the corridors was actually playing that role. And I remember when I was in Turkey this summer, I went to this place which is uh, very near Thargamon which is the old, the earliest hospital ever, which was created by, what's, it, what's the name of this place? I forgot. And they had these incredible long underground corridors with little windows, um, and, peop and the, the doctors would whisper um, whatever to the patients that were told to walk up and down these corridors, and they could hear, and it had a lot to do with hypnosis and hypnotizing and spiritually uplifting people, but, and it turned out to be the first psychological clinic um, ever in the world. And when you walk around that space, you know, your imagination just flies around this, of course, no panel at all, any more than there is in all the usual Turkish archaeological sites, take number one, this is the amphitheater, number two is, you know, etc. It goes through the names of whatever the spaces are. And you have, you're the left, is, the rest is left entirely up to imagination. But in the case of the monastery, I think there is this evil side to creating poisons and control. They were very much control freaks of the region, the monks, and they would have had to, and to be a good control freak, you have to be good cop and bad cop at the same time. And that's maybe <laughs> that duality that you have, you know, in that monastery, which is, I think, the interesting thing to bring out. And, and yes, it's true, we should not look at the monastery as just all a wonderful place of uh, um, a meditation and uh, education and a perfect environment, because it's clearly, you know, like you said, the good Catholic, as we all know, that has anyway a double-edged sword. So. No, the Franciscan uh, uh, Lubri, totally stoned by the poison and using uh, pedophiles. So imagine before the monastery, everybody around was totally scary about the monastery. <laughs> so it's scary. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, that's <laughs> romantic, that's yeah, romantic. So it's not so romantic. It's, just it's so totally romantic. <laughs> yes, I agree. It's totally romantic. <laughs> <laughs> it's more. <laughs> If I lived on this island, I would want to be in the monastery, based on my experience in the last three days. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. We'd be, it wouldn't be easy, but uh, we'd also live there. <laughs> well, we can create a new <coughs> order of gay monks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All monks are gay. <laughs> Not so new. That's the beginning of the gay club that you were talking yeah. about. The Music, drugs, sex. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Amanda <laughs> Lear. Why is she? <laughs> why is Amanda Lear? <laughs> and politics. And politics. And politics. All to the source. <laughs> <laughs> Invaded. Well, I think the jet skis are waiting. Oh, okay. Wait, I'm going to say Danica hasn't said it. But <laughs> <laughs> so I just... Uh, Thank you.
Egypt. And I want to say that there are just different ways and practices to work with sound. So the piece I hear yesterday was for me something with what I can imagine in some other place as well. Although through this architectural context and the material it sounds on the unique way, you know, but I can imagine it's not for me like a piece which is created for this space only, you know. It functions in this space, but it could function in some other spaces as well. And this is something what is uh, also different from my praxis, uh, because I make sound installation for spaces or for architectural context or historical context which uh, uh, talks to me, you know, so that uh, it, it... And then I tried with sound and with the voice to give a voice to one space and to create one, uh, not to illuminate, but to create uh, uh, for the observer a space in between, you know, to to come between hearing and seeing, and to because that is for me kind of um, kind of position uh, to being together in the world, to, to to talk from the difference, and to to be and to no negotiate and translate between hearing and seeing. So because that what we hear and that we see, it's not always compatible and that is something what I uh, try to create so it started with some of different projects we did also in Sarajevo after the war uh, when I came to Sarajevo I'm originally from Sarajevo but I lived for years in Germany and after the war I came back and um, finding myself in one city which was my home city it was a really strange experience um, so I, I felt like kind of a raised space, you know, but not only physically that everything was destroyed, but more psychologically and in cultural sense. And so um, we just started together with Sheila and uh, some other artists with this center to work really in the city and to fill this spaces with new meaning so I and I, I al always work with this emptiness you know so with this what is not so I just had this need you know to position myself and to give and I use always voices so it's kind of something what I believe in. and then it developed on the different places but I always create uh, pieces for places, you know. Uh, so I did uh, also sound piece or sound installation on one prison wall in Germany. This in Duisburg, this is one situation when you have one prison and the church together, and on the other side you have school, you know. And it was kind of the the project called constructing the truth, you know. And I just found this place, and then I. Uh, did one uh, s video, uh, no, no videos, VR projection and uh, multi channel <coughs> sound installation. But it is always kind of um, for me something what is really special for one place, and this is different from hey, the way how I, how I uh, um, hey, found hey, you. You know, your pieces because this is for me, it was more music, you know, something yeah. what, what, what could really very good function in other spaces, you know. I didn't need necessarily this environment, you know, to be able to, but maybe I'm wrong, <laughs> I'm not sure. So You're not wrong, I don't think, I don't know, I'm just trying to ask a question which is, uh, if a space before sound can be thought of as being somehow silent, uh, what does it bring to introduce the sonic element to that? Uh, when you spoke about, well, it sounds like you want to introduce uh, uh, something like an artwork that could solve the situation or make it more complex or make people think or heal the situation. Now, when people DJ, they generally want people to have a good time. Uh, what's the risk that we bring to put sonification into an area which was previously not loud? 
Okay. And I think you have to make a slight difference between a cloister, which is the cloister is the, is the area of the monastery which is reserved for silence, and that's it. So there is this element in this myth, I mean, the, the reality of monks having this silent time. If it was exclusively in the cloister, I mean, the fortress would have been for the villagers and for everybody, and, you know, living there over a period of time. And I don't think one should let that kind of monastic uh, aspect of silence and meditation just sort of permeate everywhere. I think different parts of this monastery had different, you know, and that's why I think reusing it and reinterpreting it really is important. I'm very excited about this notion of toxic and silence also. I think it's an amazing idea. Well, I think we are almost like full circle, like if we say like by introducing um, um, the sound in it, it's, it's, uh, it's like introducing love to the space, like making the selection of, uh, of pieces you are, you are really, really fully heartly into and, and uh, sharing your admiration and, and uh, um, putting it in it. And so I think this is kind of like uh, leaving like narrative and abstraction uh, and ideas of illumination um, beyond. And I think it is, it is totally like toward, toward the, uh, the future possibilities like of uh, uh, creating a, uh, an Im immaterial structure in the space, in, in particularly in this space here. I'm also very much looking forward to see what Matthew Rishi comes up with in the, his new space, because also there's Matthew's new project where he's creating a an external sculpture which in itself becomes a performance area which incorporates his own sound piece that he's doing in collaboration with two musicians or two composers. And then it also leaves that as a, as a performance space for other musicians or performers or artists to come and, and use and you know, have their own interventions inside. And that's contemporary. You know, it's a contemporary sculpture, it's an architectural piece. And, uh, and I think that's also nice because I think there's always been a fascination with old stones and old stories and, you know, historical venues and something that has that kind of spatial quality. It's also interesting to see what a new artist can do is creating a new space, which is much more open. And I think that this dialogue with space and we had, remember like, when was that, what was that musical program we had with the cosmos and uh, Sanra. the Sanra? Sounds and music and, and, oh, okay. and yeah. you know, the Australian Aborigines and sort of connection between earth and space and listening and hearing um, and creating that dialogue is I think something Matthew's been working on so we'll sort of see what happens there. That's our next project by the way so actually one of the reasons I wanted to have this panel very much and I really like to thank Hecker for trying to hold it together. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we didn't let you hold it together too much. And uh, I know all the other panelists for, for being part of it and, and all of the you know, participants. I think that's, it might make a much more interesting panel and it also gives every, it creates a dynamic which means people actually speak what they feel and think. Yeah, yeah. And instead of Why not? Yeah. As a start gate, it. As a start <laughs> gate between <laughs> blue peas and red peas. So the monastery is like a stargate to choose between red pills and blue pills, you know, matrix, of course. <laughs> and you, cho you choose your reality. Mm -hmm. And you, of course, escape from reality to another one. I still as have a, that as, as a protocol, as a protocol. <laughs> Please, I mean, imagine a psychotrop Start produced right, yeah. by Lopud. Lopud psychotrop do, done by the toxic garden. <laughs> because the monks sell. The monks is they are selling products. Land, we need to sell products with the brand of Lopud. Something that's very strange for that. And Zip we need to, to flow the system to the product from the book as an inoculation, as a conspiracy of the of psychotrop coming from here. That's cool. Yeah. It's not so romantic. <laughs> so we started with love and we ended up killing romantic. So <laughs>